I had a friend in Boston, George Higgins, uh, who was a wonderful novelist. He wrote Friends of Eddie Coyle. Did you ever read that? Yeah. Oh my God, great book. Made it to a great movie with Robert Mitchum. And George used to say, Writing is a benign neurosis. And I've often thought, that's a very good explanation for me. I got to do it. I just feel I, I have the thing. I just love it. I, loved, I, liked, I love stories. Stories are holy and nutritious and necessary and critical and crucial and, and, the, and the food of our being. If we don't have stories, we got nothing. We got nothing. This is the cruelty of Alzheimer's. That it sucks all your stories out, leaving nothing but a shell, a healthy shell. What a hell to have no stories, you know? And, and I think about this all the time as Americans. So many of our political stories are just total whopping lies. You know, it's, it's like, you're kidding. Everybody knows this is performance art. Can't we tell a real story? You know? I mean, and that's why it's so attractive when somebody actually tells you a real thing, you know, like a real story. And, and speaking here as a, as a citizen and as an Irish American from New York, I, there are times, man, when I need stories in my pocket to get me through the day. You know, believe me, after September 11th, I was, I was helpless and enraged and, and furious. And, the same thing happened in Boston. You know the story that nailed me right off the bat? People ran the marathon, the bombs went off, they realized what happened, and they kept running to go to the hospital to give blood. That's like, yeah, that's a story I want to tell, yeah, you know? But the same thing with September 11th, you know, I, 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 was, I was helpless and speak. my friends were murdered. Tommy Crowdy, Farrell Lynch, Sean Lynch, these good men, they were good boys. You know, murdered, murdered, people breathed in my friend Tommy in the five boroughs of New York. You're going to be kidding. His, his wife slept alone for 11, 13 years, 11 years. Uh, you know, his daughter, I always thought of September 12th for them. It's always September 12th for Tommy's children. And they put one less plate at the table the next day. They put three plates at the table instead of four, you know? And how do you respond to that? You know, revenge is easy and it's stupid. You know, it's stupid. My father says Bin Laden's among his other problems. He was a poor student of history. You know, to kill people, to convert them to your belief, it doesn't work. It's stupid. You know, as he says, we try that, Brian. It's the Crusades. <laughs> you know, and so, so I was helpless until I realized it was my daughter, of course, who called me on it. Again, a kid called me on it. You know, a, a, a magazine called me up afterwards and said, oh, we scrapped the editorial calendar and, you know, we're going to do a special issue on September 11th. Would you like to contribute? I said, hell no. Hell no. What are you, insane? I add to the ocean of witless commentary and vengeful prose. You know, the only thing to say is to say nothing eloquently. Bow your head and pray in whatever language you pray to, to whatever bundle of sticks you pray to, you know, and there's nothing else to say. So I started telling this to my lovely bride in the kitchen. So I said, no, Mary, you know, blah, 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 fatuous as hell. And our daughter is like 10 at that time, and she says, well, what are you going to do then? I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, Dad, you're always lecturing us if God gives you a tool and you don't use your tool. That's a sin. And Dad, no offense, but you only have one tool. <laughs> <laughs> You say so yourself. You only have one. There's only one thing you're good at. It's catching and sharing stories. So, so if you're not going to catch and share any stories, well, isn't that a sin? I'm like, go to your room. And, <laughs> but she was right. She was right. And so ever after, I, the stories of the couple that held hands and jumped from the South Tower, a man reached for a woman, and a woman reached for a man. At the lip of hell, two people reached for each other. Nobody knows who they were. Nobody, nobody, there's no video. There's no photograph. But 14 people saw with their naked, holy eyes, Two hands go out and hold on to each other before they jumped. You know, we're capable of that. The firemen who ran up that day, knowing they would never come back down, knowing they would never come back down. I called a friend of mine who was a fireman that day and said, hey, man, why did those guys run up? I mean, we, could you put out a fire on the 108th floor? And he goes, what do you think? I said, I don't know, man. Could you? And he goes, no. What are you, insane? No, we can't put out a fire. I said, then why did they go up? Why? He goes, we don't have words for that, do we, Brian? You're a writer, you find the words. You know, and, and, and he was right, man. Duty, honor, responsibility, those are weak ass words, you know. Why did they run up? Because of some kind of wild love, you know? And that's a story you gotta tell. That's a story. Hey Bin Laden, I got stories that make your stories look stupid. You know, I got big stories. You got little you got little old squirming stories. We've been murdering each other for millions of years and it don't work. Stupid. I got stories that are wild. You know, the guy who carried a lady down in her wheelchair. You know, imagine 50 floors carrying a leader. You're going to be kidding. Unbelievable courage. The people who turned and ran toward it. The same thing happened in Boston. People turned and ran to it. I'm like, yes, that's what we're capable of. You know, it's not all cruelty 
There's greatness in us that opens under, uh, under great fires. It annoys me no end. Why do we have to wait for great fires for the seeds to flower? But I, I don't know. Maybe it's the next generation. Where's that kid? <laughs> oh, they left. <laughs> so, anyway, well, there's today's sermon. <laughs> now you're all Catholic for sure. <laughs> yes, ma'am. of us is unbelievable stuff that we don't even hardly know. Once in a while I get a little flash and I think, I, I, you know, I can't stay, I can't stay dark. We had black dog days, you know, like everybody else, right? And we call it the black dog and, and the Irish. And, and on days like that, I got to reach for a story. I got to carry little stories. And, and, you know, I think of nurses and teachers and mothers and people who ran at trouble. And, you know, murder is an old and stupid story, but inside everybody. And you, and you gather in these little groups, you know, you gather in these groups. You know, you're not here for Brian Doyle, for heaven's sake. You're here for stories. Why did you read Mink River? Not because I made 99 cents for it. <laughs> but because you wanted a story. You're hungry for stories. You, you want stories that matter. You know, you want to eat a story that says something to you, that says something about love and reverence and respect and, and holding hands, holding hands against the dark, you know? People keep saying to me, what's the theme of Mink River? Especially high school kids. Like, they, they, want to, they want to cut right to the chase for the paper that's due tomorrow. Or, <laughs> what's the theme? And, and often I'll, I'll just pop out, you know, like, hey, grace under duress. That's the freaking theme, you know? Holding the hands against the dark, you know? And stay in the boat is a great Gaelic word, Mishnah, which is mistranslated as fortitude. And, and I think it means more something like stay with the boat, you know? Hold hands and take a step forward, you know? Stay with the boat. It's easy to quit. It's easy to run away. Stay with the boat. Hold hands. Here we go. You know, and to me, that's, that's I, I, I guess, uh, you know, what do I know of Mink River? I've had people tell me it's a book about wheelchairs. That was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that there's three wheelchairs in your book? I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, I've had people tell me it's a very dark book. You know, and I'm thinking, really? I thought it was kind of a book about defiant hope, personally, but what do I know? <laughs> you know? Uh, I've had people tell me, uh, that the crow is a symbol of death. I was like, really? <laughs> I'm trying to learn it to say, you may be right. <laughs> you know? uh, what was the other one I heard? Oh, it's taught, bust my soul, it's taught at the University of Portland, you know, which I find very delightful. And I visited a class and the teacher said to me, yeah, we were talking about how everybody in the book travels by twos. It's all pairings and twins, twinning all through the book. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to learn, especially at book clubs, I'm trying to learn to just zip my lip and let people tell me what it's about. But, but as you see, I can't. So, <laughs> other questions? It's 8:30. I feel like I've had you forever. Yes, ma'am. Oh, um, I'm a graduate of University of Portland. All right. And, and I recognize that um, uh, oh. essay. I wept the first time, and I wept it when you just read it. It yes. was beautiful. And uh, University of Portland gets more money from me. Thank you very Excellent. Much. Yes. Let's all call for all the motion. <laughs> what I want to know about is the little boy and the bicycle accident, which was really upsetting and beautiful. Oh, Danny. Can Danny, you talk Danny. about oh. that? Where that came from? Uh, actually, you know, it's funny. I've gotten, I bet I got 20 letters from people saying, you know, I got up to the place where Danny flies off the cliff and, and, and crashes, and then suddenly you switch to another. Subject altogether, I was ready to strangle you. It was like, uh, uh, uh. But I, one of the things I learned in the book was how to play with um, tension and, and uh, suspense, right? I had to learn that. I didn't know how to do that. And I realized, oh, if I just leave things hanging, then that's good, right? So then people will be like, oh my God, what happened? Because then you'll turn the page to find out what's going to happen. So, uh, but I can't remember how, I can't remember why I made him fly off the, I didn't kill him. You know, I did kill Red U O'Donnell, right, the old man, and I don't feel bad about it. No. I feel good about it. It's, it's, it, it. I just completely, I feel like a total hypocrite. But hey, uh, actually, one of the things I want, another thing I wanted you to notice, uh, it, 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 there's three villains in the book. Red U O'Donnell, the mean old man, there's the guy with the brown coat, right, Christie's dad, yeah. and then there's the guy who beats his son. Right? So one of the things I wanted to do that I didn't do well 
is I wanted to give the bad guys a little flash of light, and I wanted to give the good guys a little flash of darkness, right? So a worried man was a totally good guy. At one point, Maplehead rips him a new head. You know, she's, he, he's like, I'm going up the mountain. She's like, you're a selfish old bastard. You know, you just had a heart attack, and you're going to leave everybody you love and everybody who loves you. You're a selfish old man. And she's right. You know, she's right. And, and Cedar, who's a totally great guy, a, a, a worried man calls him on it at the beginning of the book someplace where he says, you know, you, you can't take care of everybody. You're not everybody's dead. You, and Cedar has this, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect everybody. I'm going to make it okay. He's got, the, he's got the paternal thing slightly too much, right? And, and so, uh, but what the guy who beats his son, it, it, there's one scene where he's trying to light a cigarette, right? And he burns his lip. And Because and, I wanted you to see, he's got a flash of good in him. He, he's like, well, I love that kid. What is the matter with me? I love that boy. Please help me. Stop. Help me. Help me. Oof. And he burns his lip. So I wanted to give you a flash of that. And, and, so, and, and so, but I had trouble killing people. You know, you know. So it was, it, I had, it was easy to kill Red U. That was fun. But Danny crashing, that was hard for me. And so even smashing his legs, was, I felt guilty, sort of. You know. And, and then the scene with the bear, who comes to get him, I'm like, that was a surprise to me, man. Wow. <laughs> you know, I'm typing along, thinking, what the what? You know? And one thing you learn is like, just keep going. <laughs> you know, you learn. I, I, you know, I learned just keep typing. You can always throw it away. Let it happen. And uh, there were several scenes like that where I was like, like Cedar turns to the bear and I think the line is something like, and he spoke to him in a language no one knew and the bear stood up and approached him. I was like, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Cool. <laughs>